Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Lucy Dunn, President and CEO of Orange County Business Council, and I am honored to welcome you to the 27th Annual OCBC and Cal State Fullerton Economic Forecast Conference, sponsored by U.S. Bank. We are here at Cal State Fullerton's beautiful Meng Hall to stream this event for you today. We wish you could be here with us, and soon we hope to get back with you all in person for our luncheons that we've always loved uh, uh, to hold together. During today's conference, two of the county's leading economic experts will share with us valuable information that can help shape your decision-making both in the business community as well as for our local elected leaders as the region's economy recovers from COVID-19 pandemic. Today, those experts help break down the numbers, the progress we're making, where we are headed, and how to best move forward with resilience. This year's Economic Forecast Conference theme, A Brave New World, Resiliency, Recovery, and Reflation, is an exploration of what lies ahead. Will we fully recover to pre-COVID levels of economic prosperity? What changes? should we plan for and what trends will drive the economy in the year ahead. With a clearer picture of these trends and how they could impact all of us, we'll be able to navigate through those coming changes with excellent strategic insight. Now, a brief overview of today's program. We will hear from Cal State Fullerton President Fram Vergee, the new Dean of Cal State Fullerton's College of Business and Economics, Sridhar Sundaram, and the President and CEO of Friendly Hills Bank, Jeff Ball. After the introductions, we will dive right into the economic forecast with our two highly respected economists, Dr. Anil Puri, Provost Emeritus and Director of the Woods Center of Economic Analysis and Forecasting at Cal State Fullerton, and Dr. Mira Farka, Associate Professor, Department of Economics, and Co-Director of the Woods Center for Economic Analysis and Forecasting at Cal State Fullerton. Stay tuned after the economic forecast presentation for an audience Q&A session. If you are viewing this stream on Cal State Fullerton's live stream page, please click through to the YouTube link to submit your questions. Now, before we begin, we must acknowledge and thank the amazing people, companies, and organizations making this 27th annual Economic Forecast Conference possible. Our title sponsor, U.S. Bank. Our presenting sponsor, Experian. Platinum sponsors, Commercial Bank of California, HBLA Certified Accountants, Titan Capital Management. Gold sponsors, Infinity Bank, Manat Phelps and Phillips, LLP, Orange County Department of Education, Wells Fargo. Corporate sponsors, Coast Community College District, Friendly Hills Bank, and media sponsor, the Orange County Register. I must also thank the 2021 Economic Forecast Committee chaired by Jeff Ball, President and CEO of Friendly Hills Bank, who was joined by a number of talented folks, including Joe Hensley of US Bank, past chairman of the Economic Forecast Committee, Tom Phelps of Manat Phelps and Phillips, Vic, House Manager of HBLA Certified Public Accountants, Trish Reed of Cal State Fullerton, Suzanne Chikuniak of Cal State Fullerton, Lauren Martin, OCBC's Events Manager, and Natalie Rubicalva, OCBC's COO and Business Development Officer. Thank you so much for your time and talent to put this event together. Now welcome Fram Vergee, President of Cal State Fullerton and Dean Sridhar Sundarum. 
Good morning. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of Cal State Fullerton, welcome. Welcome to the 27th Annual Economic Forecast Conference. I love this conference. This forecast is critical for the region and the state every year. But as we turn the corner on COVID-19, it very well could be a conduit to, as today's theme suggests, a brave new world full of resiliency, recovery, and reflation. And as we at Cal State Fullerton seek not to return to the old normal, but to blaze a new trail to a brighter future, I could not think of a better event than this to set and emulate that tone. That is what Cal State Fullerton, the OCBC, and US Bank have always been about. Trailblazing, ceiling breaking, and trend setting. Sure, we do that within our own respective lane lines of providing high impact education, a leading voice of business in Orange County, and a safe and convenient banking uh, location with integrity. But when the three of us come together, we are all the more transformative for the one thing that links us all, the people, the communities, and the companies of Orange County that we collectively serve, build, and lead. I wanna thank all of you for being such an integral part of all this success. And I especially wanna thank Joe Hensley, marketing president of US Bank and longstanding supporter of this program, Jeff Ball, president and CEO of Friendly Hills Bank and events chair, Lucy Dunn, president of the OCBC and all of her colleagues. And of course, of course, Anil Puri, Provost Emeritus and Mira Farka, who serves with Anil as the Wood Center's co-director. Together with all of you, Cal State Fullerton is proud to continue producing the workforce ready graduates that will be the backbone of that brave new world we envision and aspire to reach. Thank you so much for being here. Be well and enjoy the program. And of course, go Titans. Hi, I am Sri Sundaram, Dean for the College of Business and Economics here at Cal State Fullerton. It is absolutely my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you today for our annual economic forecast. One of our goals here at the college is to serve as a thought leader in the region. And this is how we are able to provide. This annual economic forecast is gonna be critical for us today, especially with the impact of the pandemic. We are living in extraordinary times. The impact of the pandemic had on the economy. I mean, look at the housing market, look at the overall economy and our health sector these insights are gonna be critical for us as we learn more from Dr. Farka and Dr. Puri, who are co-directors of the Wood Center. This is how we continue to serve our community, and I hope you find great value in the insights they're gonna provide us today. Wishing you all a wonderful conference, but I also wanna take this opportunity to thank Lucy Dunn and OCBC for their valued partnership. Joe Hensley and the U.S. Bank for being a sponsor and supporting us financially. These are critical collaborations and partnership that's important for us as we continue to serve our community. Wishing you all a fantastic conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for your welcoming words and thank you for hosting this conference today. I want to take a moment to give a very special thank you to Joe Hensley, who's past chair of the OCBC Board of Directors and serves today as market president of U.S. Bank. He has been title sponsor for over 16 years for this event, working with OCBC and Cal State Fullerton, and of course, U.S. Bank has been an amazing leader in our community, in our region, and our nation on so many issues. Uh, I'm honored and thrilled and pleased to thank them once again from my heart for all of their amazing insights, their direction, and their mentorship. Thank you, Joe Hensley. Thank you, U.S. Bank, once again, for amazing leadership. Life is different these days but that's not stopping us from living. Like spending quality time with family, supporting local small businesses, and doing what's right to keep each other safe. 
At U.S. Bank, we're doing our part to turn words into action. We're committed to investing in diverse communities by increasing grants and capital to support small businesses, housing, and workplace advancement. Together, we can create the momentum for positive change. Learn more at usbank.com action. Now, please welcome the chair of our Economic Forecast Committee, Jeff Ball of Friendly Hills Bank. Jeff? Hello, everyone. As president and CEO of Friendly Hills Bank, I have had the privilege of chairing the Economic Forecast Committee once again this year. It is my honor to lead us into our headline event, an expert look at the economy and where it's headed in the coming months and years by two highly respected economists, Dr. Anil Puri and Dr. Mira Farka. Dr. Anil Puri is the founding director of Cal State Fullerton's Woods Center for Economic Analysis and Forecasting. Established in 1990, the Woods Center issues economic forecasts and analyses at the national and regional level. They also provide policy advice on economic issues and conduct research in related areas. Most recently, Dr. Puri served as our university provost here at Cal State Fullerton, and prior to that, he led the College of Business and Economics as its dean for 18 years. In addition, he is currently a member of the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and serves on the advisory board of U.S. Bank. Joining Dr. Puri to deliver today's forecast is Dr. Mira Farka, Associate Professor of Economics at Cal State Fullerton and the co-director of the Woods Center for Economic Analysis and Forecasting. Dr. Farka has published in leading academic journals in the fields of monetary policy and financial economics and is a nationally recognized economist in business and economic forecasting. Having received her PhD in economics from Columbia University, she is the recipient of multiple awards for her academic research, teaching, and the accuracy of her forecasts. Her expertise is frequently sought by various governmental and private entities, both regionally and nationally. I look forward to watching these insightful presentations and will be coming back to moderate the Q&A discussion. Please direct all of your questions to the Q&A box and we will get to as many as we are able to. Once again, if you are on the Cal State Fullerton live stream page, please click through to the YouTube link in order to submit your questions. Dr. Puri and Dr. Farka, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 27th annual Economic Forecast Conference. Wish we could have you in person, but because of abundance of caution, we decided to do it online again this year. Hopefully next year we will see you in person. Before we get into the economic analysis, I want to thank our sponsors, and especially our title sponsor, U.S. Bank. Without U.S. Bank's generous support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And Joe Hensley, thank you so much for leading the bank and leading this effort for all these years. I also want to thank other sponsors whose name you saw earlier on the screen, whose generous support we badly need we couldn't do it without your help either. And there's another special person I want to thank, and that's Lucy Dunn. As you know, Lucy is stepping down from OCBC at the end of this year. She has been a phenomenal leader for OCBC and a great partner for this project. Her strategic vision, direction, and guidance has shaped this forecast for many years. We wish Lucy the best in whatever she decides to do. I know she's going to be very busy. Thank you, Lucy. Let's begin with our economic analysis. And to just to give you an idea of how we're going to cover this, I'm going to spend a few minutes setting up the national picture. Then Mira will come and give, take you through the detailed national analysis. And then I'll come back to talk about Orange County, Southern California, and California as a whole. Well, it has been quite a year, year and a half since the pandemic started uh, in what has happened in the economy. A lot of records have been set and broken. And talking about records, a quote by Yogi Berra comes to mind. Always thought the record would stand until it was broken. 
Now, I'll, I'm going to tell you the records that have been broken, but before that, let me just uh, take a moment and congratulate and hope that Dodgers make it to the World Series. I'm looking forward to that. Go blue. Well, when it comes to economy, GDP decline after the pandemic has set a new record, 10.1% decline, while the average is only 1.5. The worst that we have had so far before this was the great financial recession of 2008 and 9, when GDP fell by 4%. Employment also fell by 14.7% during this recession, while it fell only 6.2% in the great financial re recession that we had. And the recovery at the same time has been spectacular, both in GDP as well as employment. GDP has grown by 12.3% since the time, since last uh, March, April period. And the best that we had so far was 9.1%. And employment gain also has been spectacular, 13.1% for this recovery versus 5.4 for the last one that we had. This has been the shortest recession, actually, because it lasted only two months, March and April last year. GDP has fully recovered, as we had predicted last year at our forecast, uh, in the fall forecast. And not only that, it has grown beyond that. It's still below trend, about 2.3%, where it would have been had there been no pandemic. But it is uh, it's certainly above the level that we had before the recession. At the same time, employment has grown a great deal. Employment during the last recession that we had in 08-09 fell by 8.6 million jobs. This recession caused 22.3 million jobs. Now, more than half of them, three quarter actually have been recovered, but we are still 4.3 million jobs below the level of February uh, 2020, last year. And this uh, recovery has been a V-shaped recovery in many sectors, and especially the stock market. Stock market fell by 35% in March last year after the lockdown. But since then, it has been on a roaring upward trend. It's up almost 100%, 97% since then. And if you compare that to before the pandemic, February level, it's up 30%. Not only stock market, real estate, housing prices have been skyrocketing. Uh, nationally, the median home price is up almost 30%. Now, commercial real estate got hit badly soon after the recession, uh, recession and the pandemic, but it has, too, recovered in the last year or so. Compared to 1929 levels, uh, commercial real estate prices are up 15.5%. It's an amazing recovery. Now, this recovery has taken place not only because the virus has come down and then gone up, but at least for a while it was down and that stimulated demand. It is also because tremendous amount of government surplus stimulus dollars. Uh, in March of last year, after the pandemic hit, three bills in quick succession were passed. The biggest was the CARES Act, $2.3 trillion worth, then a PPP loan uh, bill for 585, and then December, another measure was passed for $900 billion. And then this year, under President Biden, we saw another ARPA bill, as it is called, $1.9 trillion, for a total of $5.9 trillion within the span of about nine months, the stimulus uh, for the economy. A lot of it has been spent now. A lot, a lot more is going to be spent in the next few months, a year or so. But it's a tremendous increase. And we did the same thing for 2008 and 9 recession. Uh, we spent a lot of money, but nothing like this. U.S. is number one in many ways, but especially this, in terms of GDP, percentage of GDP that we have spent providing the stimulus to the economy, to consumers, as well as businesses, compared to other countries. U.K. and Japan, 16%, compared to U.S., 26%, and Canada and EU, just behind us. Now, what has that led to is great uh, financial situation for households and businesses. Household got a lot of money directly, as well as indirectly, and their balance sheets are looking spectacular. Financial obligations, money that they owe as a percentage of the GDP, is down to a historic low, 12.9%. Uh, same for delinquency rates. They are at historic low if you look at the last 20 years of data. So households are in great financial shape, 
and an economy looks very robust when it comes to consumer spending. And it shows in the numbers, real spending adjusted for inflation is, has not only exceeded the level we were at in February, it is above the trend level. That's very unusual at such an early stage for a recovery to be going so sharply, and that's because consumers are out spending money and buying things. Uh, however, the spending has been uneven. A uh, lot more has been spent on goods rather than services. People are buying furniture and games and other physical products rather than going out to the restaurant or, or, or a show or, show, or, or, or spending money on a personal uh, uh, care uh, level. That's because they cannot uh, meet people on a personal level. But that has to fix. That will change over time as the recovery takes place and the economy opens up. Now, not everything is rosy. We see a lot of clouds on the horizon, and one of the major ones is a surge in inflation. Now, it's supposed to be temporary, but we'll talk more about it. It's far from clear that that's what will happen. It has uh, appeared everywhere. You look at uh, food prices, you look at gasoline, or just uh, housing. No matter where you look, you see prices going up. Now, wages have gone up too. By the way, the consumer price index is up 5.4%. And the personal consumption expenditure index indicator that uh, the Federal Reserve Bank likes to use is 4.2%. So no matter how you measure it, there's no question that inflation is much higher now than it has been, as, in fact, for the last several years. One of the problems with rising prices, uh, there are a lot of problems, is that wages are not keeping up. If you look, compare wage growth versus inflation, in the last year, this year, uh, last several months, uh, wages have, are at least a percent below the price rise. What that means is that this, if this continues, real wages, the value of your paycheck, is going to be smaller, the real value. It's going to look much smaller. The higher the inflation goes, the higher the balloon goes, the smaller the paycheck is going to look. I'm afraid that this may be the reality, at least in the near term. Now, the other concern is the virus. Delta virus hit us in spring of this year. And since then, the economy that has started to recover in February, March, earlier part of this year, has taken a tumble. As you can see, cases shown here, the third wave of the virus that, start, that happened in December and January was much higher. The Delta wave has been slower, but still pretty high. The good thing is that it seems to be coming down. If you look at deaths in the same scenario, both are coming down and hopefully they will stay down as uh, vaccination rates improve and, and, and the Delta virus uh, incidents become fewer and fewer. Now hospitalization rates similarly went up, uh, not quite, quite as high as in December, January, but they're down and they're both down. That's the important thing that we are, seem to be on, at least for the moment, unless something else turns up on the right side of the curve. Now, what the Delta virus has done, you know, economy opened up, people started going out in February, March this year, and all through the spring, and then the Delta virus hit, that depressed consumers. Uh, lockdowns were imposed in several places, and uh, consumer confidence fell dramatically. In fact, it's lower now than in the last 10, 10 years almost, since 2011. Uh, and that's because consumers are concerned about what the future will hold. Now, business sentiment uh, is a little bit better, uh, though it has it's also fell and it recovered a little bit, is at the historical average. Uh, we were hoping uh, in, in February, March, to uh, get on the other side of uh, COVID by a greater rates of vaccination. And vaccination went, rates went up, 3.3 million in March, April. But since then, they have gone down and they're barely under a million, just a few, a little bit under a million per day now at a much slower rate. You have started out very well, but it seemed the growth in uh, vaccinations seemed to have slowed down. Compared to other countries, EU, for example, started out slow, but EU has 63% of their citizens fully vaccinated compared to 55% for the United States. UK, the same story, and Canada took a sharp uptick uh, in the months of uh, May, June, July, because they accelerated their 
vaccination drive dramatically. So we will uh, need to uh, push that rate up if we want to be at least comparable to other countries and, and control the virus. Within the United States, there's a wide disparity among states. States on the West Coast and Northeast have much higher vaccination rates than states in the middle of the country. And then, of course, the worst situation is in the South and the mountain states where vaccination rates continue to stay down. Now, if that were all, uh, that would be enough. But there's more going on in Washington, D.C. that complicates the economic picture. Uh, there was, a, as you know, a big fight over extending uh, the debt ceiling. You know, when you borrow something from somebody, you got to pay. You can't say, we've spent the money, but we're not going to pay you. That's exactly what we're doing with the national debt. Fortunately, they got together, the, the Democrats and Republicans, but only for a little while. Uh, they're each blaming other for delay in uh, raising the debt ceiling and extending it into the future. And we're going to see the same kind of debate and discussion and, in, and fighting, I'm afraid, in December. That causes huge damage to the state of the economy, to the confidence uh, households have and the international community has in the United States. In addition to that, we have two humongous bills sitting right now in the Congress waiting for approval. One is the infrastructure bill, $1.2 trillion, that Senate passed and sitting in the House to be voted on. But the second bigger one is the soft infrastructure uh, for $3.5 trillion. Now, there are a lot of things in this bill, and it's not clear how many things there are and what they cost. But we know the child care tax credit is worth a trillion dollars then a huge amount for childcare and pre preschool, but also for free college, uh, public housing, and of course, uh, the climate uh, change measures. We don't know how many of these will survive and how we're gonna pay for that. Now there are some proposal, tax proposal, that will generate some real revenue, and corporate tax hike is being proposed from 21 to 26%. Individual income tax is going up from 37 to 39.6% and capital gains from 20% to about 25%. Now, these are all solid numbers. One can estimate how much revenue will be collected. But there are a couple of other things that the bill relies on for additional revenue. One is uh, savings from drug purchases. Medicare could buy uh, prescrip prescription drugs at a lower cost than people are paying right now, and there's some savings there. And dynamic scoring, which is, you know, Assuming that future growth takes place at the projected level, how much more revenue we could get. Both of these are a little soft. We did some analysis. We did some calculations to see how much of this revenue is real and how much is uh, uncertain. Of the $3.5 trillion, we estimate that if all these tax measures are adopted and taxes go up, we will get a uh, net revenue of about $2.1 trillion. But there's still a gap of $1.4 trillion that will need to be made up. Now, we don't know yet whether 3.3 trillion is what the size is gonna be. Who knows? The price doesn't look right. There are some people who want 3.5 trillion, others won't go much above 1 trillion, and they're all in between. It's called reconciliation bill for nothing. Uh, not, not nothing. It's, uh, I think, President Biden reconciling Democrats along a common agenda, a common platform, and hopefully, uh, we have a 31st of October deadline. Uh, it's doubtful that they will meet that, but the discussion right now are going on in, in Washington, D.C. So the world all, all of a sudden has turned more complex than what we had imagined earlier before the, the uh, Delta virus and, and last year at this time. Where are we? Where are we headed? Now, if I had to judge people's sentiment at this time, I will say, People are uncertain, they're confused, and they're anxious. They're uncertain about their personal income, their jobs. They are confused about virus, what they should or should not be doing. They're confused about the government policy, and they're anxious about the future because of inflation numbers going up and their personal financial you know, jobs situation, especially, uh, not being very clear. So it's a very complicated world. Not only that, not only sentiments, the real numbers, some of the hard numbers have turned soft. 
Look at employment gains, for example. Instead of growing by a million jobs, which we did in June and July, almost a million jobs per month, the gain is only up to 194,000 jobs in the latest number that we have for September. Uh, financial markets uh, are very volatile because they are not sure how the Fed is going to respond. Consumer sentiment, as I mentioned, is depressed. There are huge labor supply shortages and logistical nightmare that businesses are dealing with that is restricting the supply of goods. And then policy uncertainty is high, as I mentioned. So at the same time, however, there's a lot of pent-up demand. Underlying strength of the economy is there. The demand is there, the business is ready to go, but we have a number of issues, some short-term, some long-term, that are going to play an important role. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to invite Mira to take you through a more detailed analysis of the national picture, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Anil, and good morning, everyone. Well, we've lived in the shadow of this pandemic for far too long. I mean, here is a daily reminder of uh, global infection cases. They've come down, but they're still high. It's kind of feeling like an eternity. In fact, this kind of reminded me of uh, a student's comment in my evaluation. This happened a couple of years ago. And these, are, by the way, are anonymous. And it went something like this. If I had one last day to live, I would spend it in this class because it feels like an eternity. It's totally brilliant quote. And I do think that, you know, living in the shadow of COVID has felt like an eternity. But the good news is that, you know, it seems like the worst is behind us and we're looking forward to turn, uh, to turn over the corner. Now, where is the economy headed? Well, in fact, this seems to us a little bit like the Forrest Gump economy. It is a bit naive, a bit untried and untested, but buffeted by all sorts of major events and all sorts of challenges. In fact, just like the movie where Forrest Gump had a front row seat to every major event in American history of the 20th century, the same way this, this recovery sort of embeds features of pretty much every decade of the last century. There's a little bit of the roaring 20s. I mean, again, growth has never, uh, demand is off the charts. Uh, a bit of a Reagan-esque era growth of the 80s. We've never seen growth this high since the 80s. Uh, there's a little bit of high public debt levels, reminiscent of the 40s after the war. Of course, there's huge government largesse of the 60s. Uh, you know, we, we've kind of stimulated money growth and fiscal policy. And there's a smidgen of the glory disco days of the 70s coming with high inflation worries. So a little bit of everything, and yes, life is like a box of chocolates. But more interestingly, the years, this year has been a bit bizarre. In a weird way, it's been sort of like a tale of two halves, right? When it first started, we had sky-high hopes. We had, you know, vaccines and oodles of cash from government support. We also had an, a grand reopening, a once-in-a-lifetime reopening after the virus. And in fact, if you look at uh, expectations for growth for this year, they kept ratcheting, ratcheting it up. If you look at the Fed, for example, last October, they predicted that growth this year would be only 3.8%. However, by March, they were telling us it'll be 6.5%. By June, it was 7%. Same goes with IMF. In fact, the year was so good that even Britney Spears broke free from a 13-year-old somewhat weird conservatorship. Nicki Minaj and Stevie Nicks would be back in concerts. Things were looking just fantastic, just great. But the second half told a different story, right? I mean, we had dashed hopes, dashed expectations. Delta started to spread. Stevie Nicks canceled. In fact, if you look at Q3 real GDP projections, which will be released next week, this is from the Atlanta Fed, which tracks high-frequency GDP. Back in July, they were expecting the third quarter to be up to 6.1%. 6 Those expectations have come crashing down to about 1.3% now. So things are looking worse, and the outlook has darkened considerably. And on top of that, on top of that, on top of slower growth, we have a surge in inflation pretty much everywhere. And instead of looking at every indicator of inflation here, showing different graphs, we put together a heat map for you to look at the, to track sort of the major component of CPI, the consumer price index, where blue is where things are cooling off, right? Two to three standard deviation before the, below the five-year average. And red is, you know, things are heating up. 
And everywhere you look, if you look at apparel uh, uh, price index, things are going from blue to red, from better to worse, right? Things are heating up. You look at food, recreation. You look at housing, fuel, transportation. All of these CPI components are moving from a, from a low inflation regime to a high inflation regime. Uh, things are getting worse. And in fact, this, slow, this combination of slow growth and high inflation has got people worried about something we've long forgotten. We haven't thought about this in you know, 40 years, but stagflation is what we're talking about. Google searches for stagflation are through the roof if you look at it over the last couple of months. So where do we think we're headed? What's our new normal? Do we think that you know, uh, stagflation will be our new reality? Well, if you look at the you know, combination of inflation and growth, if you visualize it with growth in the horizontal axis and inflation on the vertical axis, right? Here you have your overheating, high growth, high inflation. Here we have the Goldilocks, where you have high growth and low inflation. Of course, recession and stagflation with low growth and high inflation. Now, we would like to be here, certainly in a Goldilocks stage where we have high growth, low inflation, things are great. Our view is that we will end up somewhere here, sort of straddling the space between stagflation and overheating. Uh, again, we do th we're called this new situation, it's a, it's a new term we've coined, stallflation. So sort of high inflation, persistently high inflation, coupled with slower growth. Now, you know, just to make things clear, uh, to begin with, we do expect growth to continue. I mean, this is a resilient recovery. It's strong. It's durable. If you look at the back to normal index, this is the Moody's back to normal index, which tracks two dozen of uh, different high frequency indicators. We're still a bit below um, the pre-pandemic levels. This is tracking economic activity, but we've gotten much better. But more importantly, more importantly, what's the important thing to get out of this graph is that every successive sort of wave of the virus has taken less and less, has damaged economic activity less and less. If you look at the first wave, which was uh, last, last spring, that killed the economy. But the winter wave, again, it kind of dropped it a little bit, but not as much. And here's the delta where you see that it has very little impact. And of course, this is it's very important to point out that, you know, fundamentals of the economy are still very strong. As Anil mentioned, household debt, 30-year low. Bank debt, 30-year low, uh, low. If you look at delinquencies, 30-year low. And yes, you know, don't tell anybody, uh, don't let anybody tell you they're better than you. This recovery can hold its, its own against the best. So certainly this is still a, a resilient and durable recovery. But we do think inflation is here to stay. Now, you've heard the Fed that basically thinks this inflation is going to be transitory. That's where the debate is right now. Uh, and, you know, unlike Forrest Gump, who wasn't aware he was supposed to be looking for Jesus, the Fed has looked for inflation everywhere, but it's come out empty-handed every single time. It, well, to be fair, they found some inflation, but they chalk it up to being uh, transitory. And in fact, if you look at their inf inflation forecasts, right, they finally admit that inflation this year will be high, 4.2%. But by next two years, it's miraculously dropped to about 2%. Consensus seems to agree, right? I mean, high inflation this year, low about 2 2.5% over the next couple of years. In fact, the Wall Street Journal survey, which actually asks people, what, you know, what is the inflation outlook for the next couple of years? Now, if you look at the Wall Street Journal survey, only 6% of the economists do think that inflation will be below 3% this, uh, this year. But 80, 81%, 85% think it's going to be below 3% over the next couple of years. You know, when it comes to the consensus view and asking a lot of economists, uh, I have something that I call the Farkas Lemma. I always wanted to come up with a lemma, not a proposition, not a theorem. That's a little bit too pretentious. I have more modest needs. But it says something like whenever 80% of the economists predict something will happen, it's a great idea to tune them out. So certainly we don't think this is going to hold. We do think that inflation is here to stay. And it will continue to be persistently high over the forecast horizon, at least over the next couple of years. And that's because it is being spurred both by very high demand and by supply constraint. Take demand, for example. Uh, if you look at real final demand, it's up 17%. That's the highest we've ever seen going back 70 years when records began. If you look at excess savings, two and a half trillion, household wealth, 134 trillion, right? We've never been this rich. Now, some of this is due to equity and home prices going up, 
but a lot of it is due to the fact that we've had unprecedented fiscal support. Anil mentioned it was 5.9 trillion. This is, look at the check-in deposits. This is total check-in deposits that have completely skyrocketed, right? Uh, and even for the bottom 50% of households, that has gone up tremendously. We've never seen numbers like this before. It will take a lot of time to, to work through and to burn this ocean of cash. So we do expect demand to, to, to continue to remain high over the forecast horizon. And it's just not just too much fiscal uh, support. If you look at the monetary side, money supply has been growing like crazy over the last year, over 25% year-over-year growth rate. Now, the good news is that uh, money, the velocity of money has actually dropped to cycle lows. Pray for velocity to stay low because if this picks up, you're going to see this will surge inflation. This will certainly will see skyrocketing inflation. And in fact, it's true historically when we go back, Every time money, money supply grew, we see a surge in inflation. You go, go back to World War I, money's growth was about 15, uh, 18.5%. Inflation rose by about 20%. Same goes for World War II. Same goes for the 1970s, right? So, again, whenever we've had excessive monet, monet, monetary uh, support, the inflation has followed, usually with a lag of about two to three years. Now... There's no question that we have basically unprecedented fiscal and monetary support, which to this point is actually becoming harmful to the economic recovery. This kind of reminds me of uh, something that Churchill said after he was asked whether he enjoyed a dinner he had attended. And his answer was, the dinner would have been splendid if the wine was as cold as the soup, the brandy as old as the fish, and the maid as willing as the duchess. So yes, this recovery would have been splendid if it wasn't for too, far too much government support. Uh, we are murdering Goldilocks. We did too little back in the Great Recession. We're doing far too much here. Stupid is a stupid does. So certainly this is a concern. But it's not just the demand side. Supply constraints have popped up and been one of the major headaches uh, during this year. And the problem with supply is that, you know, not only will surge inflation, but it will also cripple growth. Now, it won't completely strangle it, but it will certainly slow it down. I mean, we've heard, we've heard horror stories of clogged ports and, and grounded planes. And look, uh, business inventories are at cycle lows. They've never been this low. This is historically, this inventories to sale ratio, they have never been this low. Of course, business orders are the highest they've ever been, up 18% compared to pre-pandemic. The problem is supply chains are completely broken down and clogged. Order backlog is the highest it's ever been. It now takes twice the time to ship goods from Shanghai to China, 70 days up from 41 days about a year ago. Of course, this has raised the price of transportation, the PPI, the producer price index for transportation. It's the highest it's ever been since, uh, uh, since the 70s. Uh, look, I started to take these supply constraints quite seriously. When I found out they're, they're, they were actually hitting the alcohol supply, if you're not worried about anything else, that alone should kind of worry you a little bit. So this is certainly a concern. And the problem is that things are actually getting worse, not better. Uh, here we put together another heat map for you, kind of looking at various components of supply chain, where blue, of, again, is you know things are getting better and red, things are getting worse. Well, if you look at every single sort of link in the supply chain, if you look at time, the supplier delivery time is gone from blue to red. It's gone from better to worse. If you look at volume that is being transported, right, how much it's being moved around, again, that's gotten much worse because the backlog of orders is getting bigger. Price, it's getting more, more, more expensive to move things uh, across the world. If you look at inventory, if you look at shortages of labor when it comes to the logistics sector, everything is getting getting worse and worse over time, right? And the thing, the problem is that we do expect these issues to continue to persist over, at least over the next year. Perhaps by the end of next year, we no longer will talk about this, but this will last about a year. And the problem is that this is not only going to, to, to increase inflation, but it will certainly cripple growth. Uh, we tend to think that weak demand slows growth, supply shortages have a strange way, a very uncanny and unbelievable way of harming growth. Look, as someone, who, as someone who grew up in Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain, I know firsthand you learned the hard way that it is supply and then demand in that order. But by far, the biggest concern about uh, supply side issues are labor shortages. Now, there's plenty of labor demand, right? If you look at job openings, 10 and a half million, the highest we've ever seen. In fact, every unemployed person out there could, who, could get a job if they wanted to get a job. 
But the opposite is happening. Last month, 4.3 million quit their jobs. It's going the other way. In fact, if you look at labor participation rates, they're down across the board, but more so for those that are older, uh, 65 years and older, more so for women versus men, and more so for those that are less educated versus more highly educated people. And you know, there's a million reasons why people are leaving the workforce or they're not back in the workforce yet. A lot of this has to do with COVID, they're COVID related. Uh, this is a census survey for the household pulse, um, and, and they ask people, well, why are they not in the labor force? A large number, 4.7 million, said they're not in the labor force because they're caring for children not in school. This is down compared to last year when schools were closed, but it's certainly high. Another 3.2 million people said they're out because they don't want to get COVID or spread COVID, and another 4.4 uh, million are dealing with COVID. So as long as the pandemic kind of lingers around, these issues will persist. But problems are a lot deeper than this. A number of these people are gone for good. If you look at retirement rates, which you can see here, this is the trend, right? And we now, we have about roughly about 2 million people who have retired earlier than they should have. But I have a hypothetical. I think I know the real reason why these numbers look so inflated. Our very own Lucy Dunn is worth at least about a million, I think, perhaps more. So that's why these numbers look a lot bigger than they actually are. Look, Lucy, we will miss you. Uh, I only hope you have a great golf membership because I need to improve my handicap. That's all I have to say. But thank you, Lucy, for all your leadership for all these years. Now, and another issue is that some of these people will be, bad. This, this labor shortages will continue to persist. Uh, there's a Dallas survey that basically asked people how many people would go back to their workplace, to their original uh, jobs. And, and now 32%, about a third of people say they're no longer willing to return back to their jobs, up from 20% about a year ago. And these so a lot of people are trying to find themselves, they find the work-life balance that work for them, but this type of structural unemployment tends to last for quite a bit. And look, what's gonna be harder is to lure back some of the workers, especially the low wage earners. If you look at the employment compared to pre-pandemic, for high earners, I mean, it's up by 10%, but for low wage earners, it's down by 20%. It's not a matter of demand. Demand for low wage workers is through the roof. It's just the low wage workers have gone on strike. In fact, if you look at the wage premium, which is the wage you have to offer someone to lure them back in the workplace, it's up by about 7% for high earners but it's up by a whop, whopping 26% for low wage earners. So again, this is gonna be a huge problem for leisure and hospitality. They have 1.7 million openings. It's gonna be very hard to fill those positions. Well, we only saw last month, 1 million people walk off this job. So it's gonna be very hard for leisure and hospitality to come back at least over the next year. Yours truly had, the, had to suffer the indignity of having to board a red-eye flight completely sober from LAX just recently because all the airport, airport bars were closed. Something tells me this is not going to be the last sober red-eye flight I take. So this is a little bit of a mini tragedy, I must say. But, supply shortage, but labor supply shortages will continue to persist. Now, another concern, another big concern hanging in the horizon is the fact that monetary policy operates in the shadow of debt. There's no surprise, public debt was 79, almost 80% of GDP before the pandemic. It was meant to go to 100% of GDP at the end of the decade. With COVID help, with COVID relief, it's up to 126% uh, of, of GDP. So certainly through, through the roof. Of course, no amount of taxing the rich will actually fill this gap. Here is uh, perhaps the second most famous dress in the world. Uh, I'll let you figure out who the first is. Uh, but look, no amount of doing that will, will, will actually fix the debt. And the problem is that if we need to raise interest rates to combat inflation, interest on the debt will skyrocket. Interest on the debt right now is about $378 billion, almost $400 billion. If interest, by 2024, if we raise interest rates by 1%, it will, it will double. By 2%, it'll go over $1 trillion. By 4%, it'll be $1.6 trillion. And the question is, will the Fed have the political will to really raise interest rates in order to combat inflation when interest on the debt is this high? Something tells me this is a question the Fed will never like to answer. Here is our forecast. We, we are forecasting continued growth. Uh, of course, uh, by the end of next year, GDP will be up 6.5% compared to current levels. Uh, strong growth this year, 5.6% less than before, a bit less over the forecast horizon. Here is our, our employment growth. 
We do forecast we will reach levels of pre-pandemic by the end of next year, and unemployment rate will uh, slowly decline over the forecast horizon. These are end of years, will end 3.4% by 2023. So where does this leave us? Well, I started by saying that this is the Forrest Gump economy. So let me end on a wish, again from the movie, dear God, make me a bird so I can fly far, far away from here. Well, may our headwinds turn into our tailwinds, carrying us forward. May your, may your bottom line be better than the forecast. And with that, I thank you, and I'll turn it over to Anil for the regional forecast. Thanks. Thank you, Mira, for a wonderful presentation. As you all heard, there are a lot of headwinds that the economy is facing at the national level. But you know, those headwinds affect us here in Southern California as well. In fact, in some cases, it's worse. Let me give you an example. Look at the supply chain issues that Mira talked about. And we have in our neighborhood in Long Beach and, and uh, Los Angeles, two ports that carry 40% of nation's imports. They have been clogged for months now, and the clog is worse than ever before. Here's a picture from October 10th, a NASA picture, that shows you the ships that are waiting in the harbor. There were 87 ships, and now maybe about 50 ships. But interesting thing to note about that is that there are several ships close to Huntington Beach. Now, it is not only the ships that are causing the delay in supplies. You have to unload the cargo, put it on trucks or rail, take it to the warehouse, and from the warehouse, distribute throughout the country. At every step of the way, there are problems in the logistical change, chain that is causing delays and expense for everybody. Now, what that means is you got to do your Christmas shopping early. You may not get that very special toy for your grandchild or son or daughter that you're waiting for. Well, you may have to settle for a U.S.-made good. All the container ships from Asia are backed up. We may have to buy American-made products. Well, it's not so bad. It's good for the American business to buy American. But in any case, don't wait too long. Now, another aspect of this ship's in the harbor and, and drifting all the way down to Huntington Beach is, a, is of direct consequence for us. I'm sure you all heard of the oil spill a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, October 4th. A ship ruptured a pipeline and spilled a whole bunch of oil along our coast, damaging the coastline, hurting wildlife, and shutting down businesses, especially the uh, recreation, leisure, and hospitality businesses. Now, it turns out that the spill wasn't as bad as was initially assumed. Instead of 140,000 barrels of oil, it turns out that the spill may be only about 25,000. But you know, it hurt the local businesses, and more importantly, not more importantly, equally importantly, it damaged the reputation of Orange County as a place of leisure and fun. And that is gonna take some time to recover. So we, it's a small world, and we're all connected. Now, how much will it take to clean this up? Uh, we have had previous oil spill in, in Orange County. In fact, in 1990, the American trader ship spilled 447,000 gallons of oil. And then more recently in Santa Barbara, 101,000. We have some estimates of those cleanups. The Santa Barbara cleanup cost $92 million. Now, the biggest spill of all, the Deepwater Horizon off the coast of Louisiana, cost 90 or $60 billion. No, we don't think the cost of cleanup here is going to be that high. In fact, beaches are already open. They've been open for two weeks, and the cleanup is more or less complete. But still, it's a, it's a damage and a cost to the economy. Now, what has happened in the meantime, uh, during the last 20 months or so since the pandemic, that federal, state and local governments have done pretty well partly because of the giveaway by the federal, federal government. Now, our local governments and state governments don't always know how much money they have. Uh, for example, California estimated soon after the pandemic that we will have a deficit of $54 billion. By January of this year, their estimate went up to 
surplus, being a surplus of $15 billion, oh, that wasn't right either. By June, the surplus was $75 billion, which is not so bad, it's good for us. A lot of the money came from the federal government, about $42 billion under the CARES Act and the ARPA. And a lot of the money was distributed to the local communities. And we'll talk about other uses that the state is making of that money. LA, for example, got $3.1 billion. Orange County got about $1.1 billion, which is 30% of their annual budget, a lot of money. And similarly, Riverside, San Bernardino got a big chunk uh, of those surplus dollars. Now, most of, a lot of these dollars are gonna be spent to take care of COVID-related issues, vaccinations, healthcare, and so on. And some of that money will be spent on roads and, and fixing things and, and supporting the local businesses. So it's all for the good. At the same time, households have been doing very well, partly because they haven't spent much money in the last year and a half due to the pandemic. And then they got government giveaway multiple times, which is, which is enriching their, their coffer, their bank accounts. And some of that money they've spent on housing. And as a result, housing prices have skyrocketed. In Orange County, for example, in the last year and a half, housing prices have shot up by 28.1%. And half of that increase has happened from January this year to now, to, to August. Similarly, in other states, it has been the same, same situation. Now, affordability has always been a big issue in Orange County and it's worse than ever before. So if you're looking for a one bedroom cozy cottage in Orange County, your choices may be very limited. Maybe Fido will let go of his little house. I'll be careful. These little critters are very particular. Are very, they're very possessive of what they have. So housing in Orange County, only about one in five homes is listed for under 500,000. And again, about 20% of the homes are over a million dollars. So it's a pretty tight situation in Orange County as well as in Southern California. If you look at other counties, uh, it's the same situation. Orange County uh, you know, increased prices by 17.4% if you take the average over, over, over the first eight months. LA County, 21%. San Bern uh, Riverside, 22.4%. And San Bernardino, even higher, 23%. Affordability and homelessness are two of the big issues, social issues that we face both in Southern California as well as state as a whole. According to one estimate, there are about 160,000 homeless people in California. The housing costs, the way I've, we just talked about, it takes two household incomes to buy a medium family home because we expect to pay about 30%? No, it's going to take 68%, according to one estimate, of a typical median family household in Orange County to buy a median family priced home. Now, the state, to their credit, have come up with uh, a number of initiatives to alleviate at least some of the housing issues and homeless issues, thanks to the budget surplus that I mentioned earlier that we have. A number of the housing bills have been passed that will expand housing supply, one of which is an AB9, which will allow single family homes to split their lot and put duplexes or fourplexes uh, in that lot. Another is SB10, which makes zoning faster and easier. And then SB478, that limits the lot size that you have because some of the, sometimes cities and localities will set lot sizes very high, uh, thereby restricting uh, the, the, the supply of housing. There are several other bills that have been passed as well. Now, is it estimated that California has anywhere from 1.8 to 3 million units short of housing that we need? Now, AB9, other measures that have been taken, are expected to provide maybe 660,000 new homes over the next five to seven years, which is a large amount, but still would not eliminate affordability issue or the homeless issue. Now, the state government has provided uh, $10 billion to take care of the homeless. And that money is going to be distributed along a number of programs, home key programs that allow the state and localities to buy hotels and motels and turn them into uh, 
residences for homeless people. Uh, health and human services have been given $3 billion and Department of Housing and other programs have gotten additional money to support the homeless. The state has allocated $22 billion to take care of the affordability issue to alleviate that, not really take care of it, as well as for the homeless. $12 billion of, dollar, $12 billion of which is provided for tackling homelessness. Home Key, which is a program to buy motels and hotels and turn them into residences for, for the homeless. Uh, HHS, Health and Human Services, is going to get $3 billion. And Department of Housing, $2 billion. And other entities, several billion dollars. All together uh, is, is, is expected to help uh, take care of at least some of the needs of the homeless. At the same time, uh, $10.3 billion have been uh, provided for affordable housing uh, to, to low, uh, that the low-income people can purchase. Now, this is a large amount for California. We never spend money like this. Uh, but that is not going to eliminate the two problems that we have, but it'll certainly go a uh, long ways to uh, alleviate these, to, to reduce their impact. Now, you know, there are a lot of changes uh, going on at the national level, local level. Orange County is changing as well. And one way to sort of take a peek, one snapshot of Orange County, is to look at the census data that just came out. So we thought we'll show you a couple of facts about Orange County. You may have a perception of Orange County. It may be right, it may not be right. And let me just sh share with you, for example, the disposable income. It turns out that 28% of Orange County host households earn less than $50,000, compared to 38% for the na nation as a whole. The percentage is much smaller for Orange County. Between 100 and 200,000, if you add the two up, 31% and 17%, 48% of the people in Orange County make 100,000 or above. Now, that is compared to about 32% for the nation as a whole, a substantially larger amount, percentage of people in Orange County that make more than $100,000. So Orange County is a wealthy county, not a surprise, but here's the data that confirms it. The other thing that I thought you'll be interested to, to know is that of 3.2 million people in Orange County, almost a million are immigrants who were born outside the United States. And that's a very large percentage relative to other states or, or, or the country as a whole. Uh, half of those immigrants came from Asia. Uh, China, Korea, the Philippines are the three countries sending the largest percentage. 40% of them came from Latin America. Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador are the three countries that are sending the largest number. But in spite of this immigrant population and the natural growth that is taking place, Orange County's population has been declining overall. For the last three years, it is almost zero. Some years it's negative, actually, has declined. And the primary reason, there are two reasons, really. One is that Orange County residents have been, more Orange County residents have been moving out of the county to other counties or to other states. And the second reason is, of course, immigration rate that has slowed down uh, more recently. Uh, here are the numbers for uh, people coming from Europe and other parts of the world. Now, let's turn back to the economy, current state of the economy, and see what's going on. If you look at the unemployment rate, in Orange County, unemployment rate from a high of 14.9% at the peak of the pandemic, last March, April, May period, has come down to 6%, less than you know, half, but lately, as you see, it's the curve is sort of flattening out. The rate is not declining as quickly. The same is the case for the nation, for the state and the nation. For, for California, the rate was 16% during the pandemic, down to 7.5% now. And for the nation, from 14.8% to 4.8%. So a substantial improvement in the employment situation for the county and for the state as a whole. Delta virus is the primary reason why the improvement in employment has slowed down, as well as the businesses overall. Now, for California, as you can see, Delta virus, this is the last wave that you see peaking up, up, up here. Uh, this last wave peaked up at about 400 uh, cases per million for, for California, 
which is much lower than about 1,200 during December, January peak. So this Delta virus has affected us badly, but not as bad as the previous uh, episode of, uh, of the virus. Now, if you compare that to some other states, we thought it would be kind of interesting to do that. Florida's suffered much worse in this COVID, in, in the Delta virus episode than before in, in December and January. Texas had a similar impact on both of these. So California seems to have done better now than it did in the previous episode in December and January. Now, Orange County has done better compared to the rest of the Southern California counties as well. You, you can look at uh, Southern California, include, in, excluding Orange County, in the Orange County cases, uh, and that again uh, shows that Orange County has been doing a lot better than the rest. Now why? I think it's because Orange County has made perhaps better effort at vaccinations and uh, better uh, people have been taking uh, 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 you know, better precautionary measures social distancing and, and, and masking. Uh, but we will have to do some analysis maybe subsequently to find out exactly why that is happening. So we thought it'd be interesting to see why rates of uh, recovery have differed in California versus other major states. Now, we don't have to get political. It's not worse red versus white states. There are economic bases on which we can analyze the performance of different states uh, during the, the pandemic. For example, the unemployment, if you look at the employment picture, uh, California's employment fell by 15% uh, when the pandemic started. And now we're down only about 5.8% compared to the February last year when the pandemic started. New York had the worst scenario. It fell almost 20%. They recovered half of it. They're still 10% below their level. But if you look at Texas, in Florida, uh, they fell, not as much, but now they are below only about 1.6% and 3.3%, 3.3% for Florida, compared to what their level was in February. So their recovery has been better in a way, one could claim, though they started from a higher point, than California's. Now, why is that? You know, it'll take a lot more analysis and time before we can do some carefully, uh, you know, done analysis, but we can look at some quick uh, uh, measures that are available right now, one of which is the government stringency index that Oxford University puts out. According to that, Texas index stands at 40, Florida at 36, California at 54. California has been more stringent than those two states, and New York has been the most stringent at 60. Now that matches up pretty well with the recovery that has taken place. As I said, it's a rough analysis, but it's some kind of indication. Now, one other explanation is that leisure and hospitality sector has played a big role in this pandemic. They got hit the worst, nationally as well as locally, by state. Uh, jobs were lost almost 50% in just about everywhere. So we can look at the employment share of leisure and hospitality industry in different states and see if it matches up with the improvement that different states have had. Texas had the smallest amount of leisure and hospitality, and Florida has the largest amount. But that doesn't quite match with uh, Texas, New York, California, and then Florida. Doesn't match with that. So the, maybe you know, leisure and hospitality has some role to play in how quickly the economies have recovered, but that's not a full explanation. On the other side of the coin is that when you have less stringency, fewer restrictions, you're going to have more infections and more hospitalization and more deaths. And that is true. New York had 285 deaths per 100,000 of population. Florida, Texas next. California had only 179. So take your pick. You know, it, it, you know which one is better or worse, we're not going to say that. But this is what the evidence shows, that there are costs of stringency and there are benefits of stringency in terms of employment, but costs in terms of deaths. Vaccinations are the most important weapon against the virus. The more people get vaccinated, the more quickly they get vaccinated, the less the damage to the economy and people are going out and, and doing things. So if you look at that, uh, 
Percentage of people who are fully vaccinated in Orange County currently stand about 61.3%. We are doing better than LA, slightly better, but certainly better than Riverside and San Bernardino. Uh, if you look at different population groups, Orange County comes out ahead as well. In Orange County, 83% of people over 65 have been vaccinated. For LA County, the number is 77, and for Riverside San Bernardino is about 76. So Orange County, again, does it, has done a better job of vaccinating. If you look at a single dose vaccination, again, LA, uh, Orange County is 69.3% is ahead of Orange County and, and definitely substantially better than Riverside and San Bernardino. And that's good for the county's economy, opening up, things happening and people being able to do and businesses uh, able to do what they need to do. Uh, but employment data has been showing ups and downs. In fact, we seem to live in the COVID economy. As the COVID moves up and down, and we've seen it does that as the Delta virus, employment seemed to just basically follow that trend. For example, look at Orange County's employment percentage change from February. We are down about 16%. We are down only about 5.5%. Compare that to the US and California. California, and, and US, we, we, we fell about the same percent, 15 to 17%. US total employment is only 3.4% below the peak or below the February 20 level. While California and, and Orange County are pretty close. California, uh, Orange County had a sharp recovery earlier this year from about February, March to June uh, employment picked up, especially in leisure and hospitality sector. If you look at uh, other counties in Southern California, Orange County still looks pretty good. Uh, LA County ha is still 8%. They were down 16%. They've recovered half of the job, like New York in a way, by the way, uh, but they are still 8% below. Inland Empire uh, did a much better job. Inland Empire doesn't have that much of a leisure and hospitality uh, sector, and therefore they have been uh, not hurt as badly. But they're still 3.9%. So we are still hurting from pandemic when you look at employment. We are far from complete recovery, and it's going to take some time, and we'll show you some uh, forecasts that what we think is going to happen. Now, again, as I mentioned, leisure and hospitality sector has done very well. No, compare U.S. and Orange County. We both fell 50% when you look at the employment in the leisure and hospitality sector. U.S. made a much quicker recovery, but Orange County in the beginning of this year, as I mentioned, had a much sharper rise, and now we are about the same level, about 8.6% below uh, of, uh, the employment that we had at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, within uh, leisure and hospitality sector, some of the subsectors have done better than others. Arts and entertainment, as you can see, is back to the employment level before the pandemic. Food services, about 10% below where they were before the pandemic started. And accommodations are still not doing well. You know, until we have big uh, conferences and events that fills convention centers and hotels, uh, we are going to have difficulty uh, getting that sector to move up higher. Now, throughout the country, and in California, when the pandemic hit, people stopped working, stayed home. Some of them just stopped working. And some of them never came back, even when things got a little better, when they could have gone out to work. So they're just, for whatever reason, they're not working. Lately, however, in Orange County, we have seen an improvement in the labor force. Labor force is the number of people, either they have a job or they're looking for a job. You know, they're part of the labor force. That number is within 2.1% of where we were before the pandemic. Now, if you compare that to other counties in Southern California, you can see that LA and California as a whole is 2.9%. Uh, Inland Empire seem like they, <laughs> uh, they have no problem uh, people getting back to work there. US as a whole is about 1.9% still workers out there. In Orange County, 100,000 people came out of the labor force, decided not to look for a job or didn't have a job. Now half of them at least have come back. 
Well, what does that mean for employers? You know, there was a time when jobless seekers will say, we can't find work, please help. Now, you have business people saying, can't find workers, please help. Situation has dramatically changed in Orange County, but also nationally as well. In addition to official data from EDD and other sources that we crunch our models with, we also go out in Orange County and ask business people directly how they're feeling about the business conditions, what their plans are, that supplements our econometric models. And I'm gonna share some of the slides that we did the survey only about three weeks ago, so it's a very current, as to what business people are thinking uh, about the current quarter, how they think it's gonna happen. One, th one question we asked them, when will the pandemic be over? I thought it would be interesting to ask them. 10%, 10.5% think it'll be the end of this year, December. Well, some people believe that this will be over by then, though it's hard to say it will be. But about 60% uh, think it'll be a year from now or by the end of 2022. And some people say about 11% end of 23. And then the rest just throw up their hand. We don't have any idea when it's gonna be over. About 18%, a substantial number have, don't, don't want to state, don't know, uh, just leave it alone. We asked them, how do you feel about the regional economy? This is a business executive. 69% uh, feel that this quarter is gonna expand the regional economy. 20% uh, think it'll be about the same. So almost 90% think either it's gonna expand or still stay the same. And only about 11%, 11.5% think that the regional economy is gonna shrink somehow in this current quarter. We asked them about their outlook for hiring and sales. Uh, both have gone up, but relative to last quarter, they come down a little bit this quarter. For example, look at hiring plans. In the compared to the fourth quarter versus the third quarter, it's a little bit lower how many businesses expect to hire more people this quarter versus last quarter. If we look at how many people are actually gonna lower, fire uh, people or not hire them, after the pandemic, 47.3% employers said they are gonna lay off people or you know, temp put them on furlough or whatever. But now, Q3, Q4, a very small percentage, three or 4% of the people, uh, businesses think that they're gonna actually reduce the employment payroll. Similarly for sales, expectations up, come down a little bit for the fourth quarter compared to the third quarter. And people who are saying that sales are gonna go down is much lower, the 8.2% number on the right. The highest number is of course, after the pandemic, when 70% you know, of the businesses said, it's the end of the world, <laughs> more or less. But at that point, they didn't know what's, what was gonna happen. They expected sales to go down. Now, overall uh, situation in the county, based on all the survey uh, answers that we got, we create an index called OCBX, has been pretty good. After falling dramatically after the pandemic, it has gone up 18, 89.6. Uh, a little bit less than last quarter, which was about 92%. Uh, but still, businesses are feeling very optimistic about the state of local economy, Orange County economy, and going forward, what they are going, going to happen. Employment, we found, is tracks this uh, very well. And we, as you can see from here, so it's a pretty good indicator for us, forecasters, uh, how to supplement our econometric model for this. You know, a lot of you asked uh, to have more coverage for local economies for Southern California and California, and we're doing this for you, uh, getting more additional data that is of interest to you. Finally, we asked our uh, business executive, what keeps you awake? What are you worried about? And we asked that you know, several, several quarters. And the biggest concern this quarter fourth quarter was labor supply shortages. Previous quarter, it was inflation. So right now, they're very concerned about shortages, not being able to hire people, and you know, giving you enough evidence to that. Now, it might flip uh, next quarter, as, as Mira and I talked about earlier about impending inflation. We'll see how the picture evolves. 
uh, and that may become a bigger concern. But right now, those are the two major concerns. Taxes and national debt uh, are still small in spite of all the uh, discussions that have been going about, on about both of these measures. Uh, inflation expectations, we asked them, uh, when, what do you think inflation would be? What level uh, next year? Uh, about 36.4% said it'll be between 1% and 3%. 51% said between 3 and 5%, and 5%, 12% uh, said it'll be over 5%. So it seemed like, at least in Orange County, inflation expectations are pretty well anchored. But a lot of the people still believe that it'll be above the Federal Reserve Bank's expectation, which is about 2%, 2 to 2.5%. Uh, but we will have to see, because inflation expectations play an important role in affecting actual rate of inflation, believe it or not. The econometric model tells us that. So we'll continue to monitor that uh, going forward. But Orange County businesses and households are in great shape going forward. You look at the deleveraging of the debt. They have reduced debt substantially. And I want to thank our sponsor, uh, Experian, who kindly provided us with uh, very reliable current data to uh, analyze. In Orange County, for example, the debt has declined, uh, the, the, the debt level, by 2.2% uh, in last year and about 1% this year. So, and that's compared to the previous several years, that's a substantial reduction. That is the same is the case in LA, Riverside, and San Bernardino. The, because of all the money they've gotten from the government, plus money they didn't spend, has they have paid off their credit card. And these are, this is non mortgage debt, credit card. Uh, they are in a much better f uh, financial condition to go ahead and, and borrow uh, because the debt levels are so low. Not only that, their credit scores have been improving. Late payments, for example, they have been declining for some time, but they really plummeted in 2021 because people had money and you know, paid, their, paid their bills on time. Why wait? Uh, that has been true for Orange County as well as Los Angeles and Inland Empire. Are a very sharp decline in the last year and a half since the pandemic started. Also, their credit score up, Vantage score, over 800, believe it or not. It's come down a little, but it's a substantial improvement in credit score. So what, that, what does that mean for us, uh, for us economists, for business people? Households are flush with money, flush with cash, strong balance sheet. They have less debt and a credit score up. And what are they going to do? They're going to spend them. They can't wait to spend their money. Uh, and we expect that economy will benefit in multiple ways from that. Not only housing prices going up, which is you know, a different matter, though we believe that housing prices are going to stabilize next year. And we expect by the end of 2022, you're going to see about 5%, which is sort of the average price increase. Uh, that will start uh, prevailing uh, uh, starting 22. We, you can't have 28% you know, increase in 18 months going forward. But that means that businesses will have uh, more, higher profits, higher sales. They'll be hiring more people. Employment will be picking up. So we have given, showing you the last slide, uh, the payroll forecast for Orange County this year Things because of the Delta virus haven't been very good. We expect only about 1.9% increase in payroll jobs. But next year, 3.8%, which is pretty good. It's about twice the normal increase for Orange County. And 23, we were projecting 3.3%. The same is the case for LA, though LA's growth has been slow so far this year. And we expect that it'll be a slower recovery in Los Angeles County, which is the largest county, as you know, in Southern California. So it affects Southern California area as a whole. Riverside, San Bernardino are going to do be, be, be doing a lot better. Unemployment rate, we believe right now is 6%. By the end of next year, 2022, it'll drop to about 4.5%. And by the end of 23, it should be below 4%. So all the way around, we expect a bumper year in terms of employment growth in 2022 and 2023 going forward. So it's a very positive, upbeat, uh, uh, scenario is based on assumptions that we have outlined before, and let me repeat those. We believe that 
the Delta virus will continue to uh, subside. Vaccination rates will continue to slowly move up so that by June of 2022, we will have what we call herd immunity, about 80, 85% people being uh, immunized completely. We also believe that Federal Reserve Bank and, and the federal government won't bungle things up at the national level, and they have a prudent monetary and fiscal policy to guide the economy in these turbulent times. Uh, and so those are our basic assumptions and those are our forecasts. And I'm gonna stop here and we'll be right back to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Cody! Hi! Hi. How are you? I'm good, I'm crocheting. I see that. It started off as a hobby, kind of snowballed from there. And Alex, I don't want to stop. Well, I don't see why you should have to. Let's set you up with a side gig savings goal on the US Bank mobile app. This way you can turn it into your main hustle before you know it. You're my hero, Alex. What are you working on now? Pool cover. That's fun. Oh, I made my wife a bathing suit. Oh, did Linda like it? She did not. Oh. You should see what I made for Max. Max, look at him. He loves it. The confidence to make your dream a reality. US Bank, we'll get there together. back everybody and Anil and Mira thank you so much for the comments that you provided today and also thank you again to our title sponsor US Bank this is now the Q&A forum so if you are on the live chat make sure you submit your questions I have an iPad with me where I can receive those questions and um, I wanted to start off Mira maybe with you um, following up on some of the comments that you were providing in regards to this massive government intervention that we've seen. I mean, this is, if you're a Keynesian economist, you're, you're, you're just, you know, <laughs> this is in heaven. love with what's happening here, right? <laughs> it's but, heaven. But I'm more concerned in terms of the long term. And what does this debt mean for the economy going forward from a longer term perspective? And specifically around interest rates. You had some comments in there regarding the Fed Thank and you. some of their action, but, but I'd be interested in some follow-on comments about just the impact of this huge amount of deficit spending. Absolutely, that's a fantastic question. In fact, that's probably the most important question uh, going forward. And as I mentioned in the, in, in the presentation itself, one of the most important things we have to worry about is whether the Fed even has the political will to perhaps combat inflation, to be able to actually rein in inflation. Uh, and, and, and if you think about the numbers that we actually played, you know, if interest on the debt is one and a half, one and one and six trillion dollars, uh, that would happen if interest rates go up to four percent. Three percent will be one point two trillion. These are enormous amount of money. And my question is, are we going to be willing to raise interest rates if monetary policy lives in the shadow of debt, which it does? We were able to do it back in the 80s, but back then the debt to GDP ratio was 25%. Right now it is, I mean, by the end of the decade, it'll be 126%. So that is certainly a huge question, and that's why we think inflation has truly changed the calculus in this recovery. And, and that's one of the biggest issues that will face us going forward. Certainly this oodles amount of cash from government, it was helpful while we were during the crisis. Having extended it for about 18 months after, it's absolutely becoming harmful to this recovery, which was what we were trying to get at the presentation. Yeah, well, the question is how much is too much, right? Well, and, right. And maybe we're there. Sure. Neil, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, let me add, not only uh, how it affects the monetary of inflation situation now, longer term, there are dire consequences, possibly. Uh, the value of currency, as more and more money is flooded into the economy, look at cri cryptocurrency uh, issue right now. The reason people are moving to that is because they don't trust that the value of the dollar will be maintained over, over time. So I think there are uh, major long-term consequences in addition to having to pay 
a big portion of our uh, tax revenue in terms of debt uh, uh, interest payments. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, a question that's come in, Mira, is in regards to the wage premium that you right. referenced in your discussion. And, and clearly, I, I think this is all tied to the labor shortage right. concern. I know in the recent poll that you guys did, it, it's moved from inflation to labor shortage. Right. And we're going to sure. come back to that in a second. But t talk a little bit about wage premium and, and what you mean by right. that. So, so the simple point I was trying to make is exactly that. Uh, so we have two big issues. We have inflation and we have supply issues. And in the supply issues, one of the biggest concerns is the labor shortage. Everybody knows that. The question is, is it going to be persistent? And it sounds to me that it is going to be persistent. And the very numbers I was showing, the wage premium, which I probably should have uh, illustrated and explained a little bit better, is the wage that you need to pay people in order to entice them back into the workforce. Uh, it's another sort of a jargon in economics. It's also called the reservation wage. How much are you willing to hold out for? And for the low-wage workers, that premium has gone up to 26% this year. Uh, again, lots of government support, the, the, the child tax credit that is now becoming uh, a regular payment. All of these are sort of disincentivizing people to join the workforce. And I worry that this will become an endemic issue. So we have a pandemic, and now we're going to have an endemic of shortage of especially low-wage workers. Leisure and hospitality is going to have a hard time hiring. That was my joke. I mean, I think I'm going to have to take a lot of uh, sober red-eye flights because airport bars were shut. So that was uh, one of the problems that I sort of encountered. But certainly this is, this is something we have to deal with in the future. And better policies have to be put in place to incentivize people to go back to work. Yeah, well, and, and Neil, obviously that's a sector very important to Orange County, yeah, right? Absolutely. Hospitality that's dependent upon the access to that type of labor. Exactly. And it's very hard for people to find a place to live here and yeah. move to Orange County. So we, we have a real issue in that. But let me also add, you know, it wasn't very long ago that we were talking about 15-hour minimum wage and it's so high. Now, given the reservation wages, the way they've been going up, and inflation, that would be, be a moot issue. Yeah. And, and the other yeah. concern is that it, as, as workers demand higher wages, and if it spreads, it becomes endemic, as Mira said, it has consequences for inflation. Mm -hmm. Wage inflation mm -hmm. is one of the major reasons overall inflation rates will go up. So if it becomes endemic and it becomes a cycle, uh, we will have a real problem. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but... Uh, there's a possibility. In fact, I mean, let me add up on, on what Anil said. It's true that if you look at the National Federation of Independent Businesses, they have a survey, about 30% of uh, the highest we've ever seen of small businesses that are planning to raise, raise wages. Right. About 50% of them are, are planning to raise price, uh, increase prices. So you can see that this, is, this wage inflation spiral that Anil will mention in, will probably pick up. That's the concern that we have. That's what we think inflation mm -hmm. is going to last for a lot longer than what the consensus on the Fed is telling us. Yeah. I think few people are getting around to our view. I think we were one of the few <laughs> ones early on to say this. Yeah. Uh, everybody's sort of catching on, but we've been saying it for a few months now. Oh, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit more about this correlation of employment cost and inflation. And some of your thoughts in terms of where we go from here. I'm thinking about some of our smaller, medium-sized yeah. businesses that we have in the county that don't have the resources that larger organizations have and yeah. how you see that playing out as it impacts our ability to achieve growth in the county. Yeah, you know, the uh, pandemic has caused so many disruptions and changes. And you know, one of the subtitles word in our uh, forecast is resiliency. <laughs> and so it's not easy to do that, but it's important, it's essential, it's necessary. So. Both the workers and employers have to figure out new ways of doing things. Work, businesses have already started substituting digital uh, systems and anything digital, non-person involving, to do their business. So, and, and technology is helping that out. So there is, is an ongoing transformation in the uh, economy that always happens, but has been accelerated to have technology substitute for workers. Workers at the same time need to be better skilled for jobs that require technology, it requires higher training. And so there are the things to be done on both sides moving forward. I expect that to happen. It's not easy, uh, but it is bound to happen given the condition that we have right now. I agree. Uh, I mean, you can see it already that a lot of people have moved towards uh, automation. 
but not everything can be automated. Although, you know, when it comes to, you know, you go to a restaurant, you get a menu that is sort of, you don't need, you, need a, you don't need actually a server. Uh, you, can, you can have a iPad to order. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's going to be challenging uh, for the lo for the short term and the long term, especially in, in Orange County that relies so heavily on leisure and hospitality, because when you have these policies that sort of disincentivize work, you're going to have this persistent shortage of labor. Uh, and, and, and other than raising wages, which will spiral upward to raising prices, this problem will persist. We're a bit, we're a lot less optimistic now than we were earlier in the spring given the, all the changes in policy that have occurred, which have sort of created this, this, uh, this work disincentives. If, just the simple statistics, if you do, do the math, given the number of unemployed and how much unemployment benefits have been doled out over the last 18 months, on average, every unemployed person has gotten roughly about $65,000 a year, which is much higher. I mean, keep in mind that a quarter of households, their uh, yearly income is about 30, uh, below 37000 mm -hmm. So certainly people have a lot of cash. That's good news. Nobody's actually gro I mean, it's grouching on that. But we have to keep in mind that it, it does have these other consequences that are negative for the economy and growth. Right. So the other side of this is housing. Right. which yes. is so important, sure. such a big issue for us here in Orange County. And Anil, in your comments, I think you had talked about something about a forecast of like a 5% mm -hmm. increase or something like that that was in there. And we have a question that's come in asking how you think those California policies that you referenced in your presentation, how those and perhaps other policies might help to offset some of those increases. Sure. What, what impact do you think yeah. those policies will have? You know, housing prices are an issue uh, nationwide, but especially here in Orange County. We have always been an expensive place to live. But this recent price increase has really uh, done a number, as they say, in the housing market, people who want to buy homes. Median price is a million dollars now in Orange County. It's matching uh, Northern California area. And the problem with that, not only because it's expensive, it affects who can afford to live here, young people, who are raising a family, unless both of them are working and have good jobs, it's very hard to make do and make the payments. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way in the Orange County to attract people like that who, who can afford a, a home to live here. So it's important from that point of view, from the economic growth point of view. Now, the measure that the, federal, uh, that the state government has implemented, putting in about $22 billion, both for homelessness and housing, they'll help. And, and all the laws, all the bills that have been passed most recently. But that's going to take time. It's going to take five, seven, ten years maybe before we see an actual impact of that in, in higher uh, uh, supply of housing. Uh, every little bit helps. Uh, these are small patches. There is no long-term solution other than finding a magic way to create cheap housing. Yeah. And well, that's not going to happen. Well, let me, uh, we're going to have more congestion. Uh, which is inevitable in some ways, but we have to do it smartly. No, I just wanted to add a little bit, uh, let me, color me skeptic a little bit when it comes to California building homes. Uh, I, I, know, I know they have grandiose plans, throwing $10 billion for, uh, to, another $10 billion for homelessness, another $12 billion for housing. Uh, I, you know, it, it's, I, some of it may be wasted, and a lot, I mean, if you look at the number of houses they're talking about, 7,200, for, for a couple of billion dollars seem to me super expensive homes, basically killing a, a, a problem with a big, throwing more money to it, it won't get any better. And, and you know, we haven't been able to deliver so many homes in such a short period of time. The, the plan that was announced earlier, a couple of years ago by, by Governor uh, Newsom, never came to fruition. They were gonna build five billion homes over five years. We barely can scrape about 100,000 a year, right? So it's, it's actually, uh, I think we have to be a bit realistic about how much the government could do and how much we can rely on that. So I'm a bit more skeptic. And, and a great follow-on question that just came in, we talked about inflation impact on interest rates. Will the increase in interest rates have an impact on the value of housing? Oh, well, higher mortgage yes. rates, you know, it's going to depress mm -hmm. uh, housing prices. Uh, as, as, we, as I pointed out, that we expect uh, housing price increase to drop down to about 5%, which is uh, 3 to 5% on average basis by the end of uh, 2022 and, and to 23. And, uh, and that's logical, given, given the way things have worked in the past. It's a cycle. Housing prices are always cyclical, and housing supply and demand also. So they respond to market conditions. As rates go up, we're going to see that impact. Great. 
Mira, let's transition into commercial real estate and talk about now we're in this post-pandemic, we hope, this post-pandemic environment. And what changes do you see in commercial real estate as a result of the pandemic? And what do you forecast for commercial real estate going forward? So the good news is that the commercial real estate actually has done much better than people expected starting early this year. Um, you know, commercial real estate overall, if you look at the, the core price has gone up nationally. Same story in Orange County. So things are looking a little bit better uh, than many expected. We're not that surprised. We did expect a comeback. I mean, offices are, com are, are, are reopening. We do see some long-term changes, which is smaller office space, smaller footprint here and there, but certainly that sector which should continue booming. We do see continuing sort of trends between apartment rents, whether you're downtown versus in a suburban area, and those th trends are expected to continue. But overall, we do our, we are quite bullish on the commercial real estate sector. Uh, industrial warehousing is going to continue to boom, given especially the issues we've seen with supply changes, right? So different sectors, even though some of, a lot of them were harmed differently during the, re during the recession, they're sort of all coming back together, uh, coming up together out of this recovery in a way. Mm -hmm. So we are quite bullish in a lot of the segments. Again, a little bit less so about apartments downtown versus suburban area. Office market should do well. Retail is another, but retail has the other issues. Those are longer term issues. Yeah. And this longer term downtrend will probably continue given especially the boost in online shopping. But overall, we, we are quite positive on commercial real estate when it comes to offices and especially when it comes to uh, industrial space. Right. And the commercial uh, properties, I think they are going through transition, as I mentioned earlier, changes. Because people are working differently. Businesses are employing uh, workers differently, partly from home, partly go to office, but even then share offices rather than have a permanent office. So I think commercial space is going to go through transformation, and we will see how that evolves. It, uh, it all depends on how individual workers behave. But there are changes, especially in that market. And I agree with retail. I think they have some That's deep, a longer term. deep structural That's problems. That's a longer-term problem, given, yes. given the prevalence of online shopping. Yes. No, absolutely. And as you yeah. pointed out, start your Christmas shopping today, <laughs> right? With all if those ships lucky. out in the port, <laughs> if you're lucky. Well, I want to thank both of you for your comments today. This has been a great partnership with uh, OCBC and Cal State Fullerton. And we look forward to many more years and working together with you. And thank you, all of you that have submitted questions. We appreciate your participation. Thank you also for attending. Uh, at this time, I'd like to thank our staff, both at the Orange County Business Council as well as Cal State Fullerton, who helped us pull this together. It was not optimal to have to do it virtually. We look forward to being in person next year, but the staff has come through as they always do to really help us put together a nice platform for you today. I also wanna thank my committee for all of their help. And of course, thank our sponsors for allowing us to have the resources that we could provide this to our viewers online uh, without charge. So uh, I hope you all enjoyed that and, and please recognize our sponsors. And lastly, I wanna thank Lucy Dunn. This has been referenced a few times already. Lucy will be retiring at the end of the year. Um, Lucy, it's been an honor to be able to serve and be part of the Orange County Business Council, particularly in leading this committee. So thank you for all that you have done, not just for the council, but for all of Orange County. So we are resilient and we are Orange County and we're gonna see through this. So Lucy, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Jeff, for that insightful discussion and really appreciate highlighting those key findings from the economic forecast. Thank you as well, Anil and Mira, for another illuminating look at the economic road that lies ahead for Orange County. No matter what comes our way, it's clear that Orange County is an economic powerhouse that has shown a great deal of resilience in many, many years of tough times, and especially this last year. Certainly, we will continue that economic powerhouse to drive our own economy as well as um, the whole Southern California economy. I hope the insights and information that you heard today from these 
outstanding experts will be helpful to you as you map out your strategies for the rest of 2021 and beyond. Thank you again to our title sponsor, U.S. Bank, for your generous support of this important event, as well as another thank you to our presenting sponsor, Experian. This concludes our program. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Go Titans! Mm -hmm.